Well, good morning, Walden Church. I was just thinking about how it's so great to see all of you returning to church. We're seeing all of our friends, seeing all of our neighbors come back. And I thought, you know, let's take this month as a time to recap, right? Let's just recap what it is that we do here. Because even if you've been coming to church for your whole life, or maybe it's only been for a short while, you kind of have to admit, church is a weird place, right? I mean, it really is. Many of you probably don't realize it because you were raised in the church, but think about how someone would react walking in here who had very little church experience. For instance, where else in your life do you sing, right? I mean, in the real world, where do you sing? Maybe you sing in the car. Maybe you sing in the shower. Maybe if you're a stay-at-home parent and you got those Disney songs on permanent revolve in your head, you, you, might, you might be singing. And where else in your life do you sit through a lecture? I mean, you probably haven't sat through a lecture since school, but every single Sunday, you actually give up one of your weekend days to sit and listen to a guy talk for 30 minutes. That's crazy. I mean, if, if all of this were on television, you, you would not watch that show. <laughs> so we're talking about this uh, all month long, being the church where you live. We're going to look at church culture, where it is, where it comes from, perhaps maybe even where it's going. And hopefully somewhere in there, we can also talk about what it means to do church and, and to be a church here in our community, here in Walden, here uh, where our neighbors are literally our neighbors. And so the first thing we have to kind of square away when we talk about church is this building is just a building, right? You are the church. Back in Bible times, the ancient Jews, they would build their faith around three very important things. The temple, the sacrifice, and the priesthood. And when Jesus died, the Bible says that he did away with all three of those things. Today, Jesus is our high priest. His body is the temple, and his sacrifice was the last sacrifice anyone would ever need. In fact, Christianity is the very first non-temple-based religion to ever emerge. Listen to how the Bible describes the early church in Acts chapter 2. They, the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When you look at that uh, little grouping of verses, and then you look at all the other times the word church is in the Bible, it's always referred to as a group of people, not a building. Yes, culturally, we build churches right? Absolutely. But we all understand the difference. Just to be clear, when Jesus began the church, when those people met, it was always centered around a group of individuals. In fact, it's not even until 190 AD that we start to see the written phrase, going to church. And all of that changed with the Roman emperor, Constantine. Somewhere around 320, Constantine had become a Christian, and he began to order the building of 
Christian temples, Christian churches. He hadn't been a Christian for very long, but it made sense to him that if the Jews had temples and the pagans had temples, then Jesus should have a temple. Constantine first began to build his churches on or near cemeteries dedicated to Christian martyrs. His thought was, since the ground contained the buried dead of holy men and holy women, then the ground was sacred, so that was the perfect place to build a church. Many of those cemeteries already had Christians going to visit them. Either they came to pray or they came to eat or worship, so Constantine felt it's only natural then to put a building there to uh, be a place where people would go to naturally, and then he would name his churches after saints and martyrs, since at that time pagans used to name their churches after pagan gods. Constantine built nine churches in Rome, including St. Peter's, St. Paul's, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And as you can imagine, if you're building a Roman building, <laughs> and you're going to use Roman architects, you're going to use Roman builders. So what did every new church look like? Well, it looked just like Roman buildings, right? It looked just like a pagan temple in uh, Roman times. What you and I think of as the classic Christian church architecture is basically a hand-me-down from the Romans. In fact, when you think about churches having a tax-exempt status, Emperor Constantine came up with that idea too. Constantine had also made Sunday a national holiday. So, and don't get me wrong, Constantine at that time uh, was beloved. People loved him. They saw his rise to power as an act of God. But in a lot of ways, when Constantine started doing this, Christianity got rebranded. It, it was a relaunch, really, in a, in a shiny new age. It got a makeover because the church before it was largely underground. It met in homes. It had no holy items, no holy relics, no holy buildings, no employees, no temple priests. Basically, when Jesus started the church, it was very grassroots, and all of that changed with Constantine. And in many ways, the church today looks more like the church Constantine built than it does from the book of Acts. Is that a bad thing? No, not necessarily. Largely because there's nothing in the Bible about how to do church. The Bible is not a church instruction manual. And this is largely why you can find two neighboring churches who both do church vastly different, and yet they both would say they love God and they love others. All of those different ways of doing church is what we call denominations, right? It's one of the first things your friend will ask you when you tell them you go to church. They'll say, oh, really? What denomination is it? Walden Community Church is a non-denominational church. And all that means is we are a church that's independent. We don't take our views or our faith from any parent organization. We also don't send our money away to a parent organization. But don't kid yourself, non-denominational is also a denomination. <laughs> as soon as you have a group of churches who say they're all non-denominational, like it or not, everybody else groups you together as one group, whether you want to be grouped together or not. So you try not to be a denomination, and by doing so, you group yourself together with other churches who are doing the same thing. But uh, a lot of people, I don't think, are really locked into a denomination. In fact, most people, I think, they pick their church or they pick their denomination based on three things. Uh, tradition, right? They walk into a church and say, is this how I was raised? Is this the liturgy? Is this the worship flow I am familiar with? Two, location. People go to church close by, right? They go in their neighborhood. And third, likability. 
Do I like the pastor? Do I like the worship? Do I like the children's program, the men's group, the women's group, etc.? Interestingly, Jesus did say something about this. And it's part of what I want to talk to you about today. Before Jesus goes to the cross in John 17, Jesus has a prayer. John 17, verse 20, he says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus says, what I am praying for is unity among believers. In verse 22, he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. See, what's interesting about this is this is basically God talking to himself, right? I mean, out of all the prayers that have ever been prayed, you would think that the one prayer that would get answered would be the prayer that God prayed, right? Absolutely. So do you see the reason Jesus makes this prayer? The reason why Jesus wants unity among believers. He says, why? He says, so the world will know that you sent me. That was Jesus' big plan for evangelism. That's his, that's his strategy. We are, we are his followers, and then we are united, right? We are united. Not, not just happy, kumbaya, holding hands, not like that. Jesus says we're, we're united in the same way that he and the Father are united. And then he says, and then if that happens, the world will know that Jesus came and that Jesus loves them. You know what that means, right? It means if the world does not know those things, then that's on us. That's, that's our bad, right? Sadly, I see Christians trying to distance themselves from so many things. They try to separate themselves from a lot of things. They build walls and they say, thank goodness we're not like that church. We're better than that body of believers. They, they really got it wrong over there. But we are the true church. In Matthew 22, Jesus is asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Just from those few verses, we at Walden Community Church, we communicate that, that idea with only four words, love God, love others. That primarily should be the strategy of the church. Now, does it matter if we meet in a building? Does it matter if we meet as a home? Does it matter if we're a denomination? No. None of those things matter. First John 4 says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So John basically says, if we love one another, then the world will see God. Why? Because the Bible says God is love. You can't have love without God. So does it matter if you use one translation of the Bible over another? No, it doesn't matter if we worship on Sunday or Saturday or Wednesday. No, not to Jesus, because Jesus says the greatest form of obedience and worship is love. The greatest form of obedience is to love God and to love others. In fact, Jesus even says that love is the criteria, the definition of a disciple. John 13, Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another 
as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There it is again. Disciples, Christians, churchgoers, we are to be lovers. We are to be known by our love. We love God. We love others. Everything else comes second. But if loving God and loving others is the strategy, that strategy needs to be working towards something, right? We need, we need a goal. And you'll find a dozen different reasons for what some believe that what's the goal of the church, right? But see, here's the thing. This is God's church. So we should always seek his will. And, and we need to look at what he wants. And one of the first things we see that he wants is God wants holiness. God wants holiness. Holiness is definitely one of those church words, right? And certainly not one you hear anywhere else. But holiness is exactly the bar, and it's the level that you and I need to maintain in order to be a disciple, to be a witness. 1 Peter 1 says, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. The church is the bride of Christ, right? We are, we are the people of God. We are the called out ones. We are the separated ones. We are people who are placed aside to be his. We are his children. So just as a married couple belongs to one another, we are set aside to be God's. We, we are in the world, but we do not belong to the world. And see, some churches will say, well, job one for us is growth, right? We're doing everything we can to grow. But if growth is the goal behind the love, then love is manipulative. Love is inauthentic. If growth is the goal, then church becomes a corporation, right? Then we start looking at graphs. Then we start talking about business. There's a lot of big churches, lots of big successful churches, and there's nothing wrong with that. But no matter what the size is, the first thing we should be worried about is being holy. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Notice here that holiness is linked to purpose. It's tied into our goal. We are to be holy so that you can declare. Holiness validates our witness. And that only makes sense. Nobody's going to take exercise tips from somebody who weighs 400 pounds, right? And so that falls on us again. Peter says, it's our holiness that declares our praise. Jesus says, it's our love that defines us as disciples. A church without holiness and a church without love may grow larger. But I don't want to be that church. Do you? And I'm not trying to bash large churches here. Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of healthy, vibrant, and holy large churches. But what is the biggest complaint you will hear in a large church? This all just feels so fake, right? It just feels artificial. It feels like a show. Fake is what happens when churches grow without holiness. Fake is what happens when churches become inauthentic, when they forget the purpose behind evangelism and they just grow because they want to grow. Church is a tool. Church growth is the byproduct. But the goal is holiness. The goal is the great marriage of Jesus. It is the bride and the groom for all eternity. Our church grows because we love God. Our church grows because we love others. God wants holiness. God wants us in ministry. So if holiness is about who we are, then ministry is about what we are doing. We are doing acts of ministry, right? 
Luke 14 says, then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Jesus prays to God in John 17, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The healthy, authentic church was born from an inward and an outward movement. Inward and outward growth. Holiness is about how you practice discipleship. It's how you grow and mature as a Christian. But ministry is the rolled up sleeves sweat of the church. Those are the motions where you perform acts of mercy, acts of justice. This is where love hits the streets where love acts. And and ministry doesn't have to be just helping out on Sunday morning, okay? I know we communicate that a lot. And and I would much rather have you in a ministry that takes place outside of Sunday, outside of these walls, because that's that's where the people are, right? The people are out there. That's That's where Walden is. If you are going to be at the church where you live, then you need to have a focus that is out there. Because I get it, being a greeter or working in the kitchen or being a Sunday school teacher, that's not your thing. That's fine. Don't beat yourself up because you don't feel called to fold bulletins or to rock babies. That just means there's something else for you to do. Jesus says in Matthew 25, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me. Notice, Jesus just says ministry is is for others, right? It's for others, and as it's done for others, it's also done for God. The problem is when church ministry is only done for numbers, or it's only done for growth. Again, that's not an authentic witness. And again, you're gonna grow into being a fake church God wants holiness, God wants ministry. Now, does that mean God doesn't want growth? No, of course, God wants growth. God wants growth. Colossians 2 says the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Matthew 16 says, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. We should grow. God wants growth, and we should never have the mindset that, oh, our church is small, and I like that. I like my church exactly how it is. Who are all these new people? I I, I just like it when my friends are here. Well, that's too bad, because God wants your church to grow. And I think if the choice is between what I want or what God wants, God is always going to win. Okay, loving people, if that's our mandate, right, to love people, that's hard work. And the church is your home. It's the place where that love happens. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take hard work to make this a home that loves others. And if this church is not your home, right, if you're still a visitor, if you still feel like you're new, that's okay. That's okay. It'll it'll take a while for this church to feel like home. Remember, for the early church, it was only a church if the people were there. And that's no different today in 2022. When I walk through this building during the week, when you're not here, I never think to myself, I'm at church. Because it's not church when you're not here. And so I I wanna show you three things that you can do that'll help bring holiness, ministry, and growth, okay? First easy thing you can do, pray. We can pray. First Timothy says, I urge then, first of all, that petitious prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Right there. Right there. 
pray for holiness, pray for godliness in our lives and in the lives of others. If you have a church directory, go through it and pray for those people, especially if you haven't seen them in a while. When you're sitting here in church, look around at all the other people and pray for those people. Pray for their godliness, pray for their holiness. This also says we should pray that everyone be saved, right? Every Sunday, do you wake up and do you pray that you will see new faces at church, that every seat would be full? And if you don't pray for that, why? Why don't you pray for that? Isn't that what we want? Don't we want that? Ephesians 6 says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray for your neighbors on your street. Pray for the kids that are in your child's class. Pray for relationships. Pray for opportunities. Many of us could say that we don't even have an opportunity to invite someone to church. We don't know somebody that we could invite to church. Okay, then pray for that opportunity. And if you think you're shy or you think you, you're, you're not bold enough to do that, then pray for boldness. Pray for strength. Last week we said that being the church where you live starts in the home. Okay, then with your prayer, start there. Start in your home. Tonight, I want you to go home and pray through your house. Pray for the rooms that are in your house. Pray with your spouse, pray with your family, and pray that God transforms your home into a place of holiness and godliness. Say, Lord, the early church met in a home. How may my home be used for your kingdom? on this block, in this street, in this community, for my church. We can pray. We can pray and we can bring. John 1 says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that John had said and who had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to go and find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. You know, many of the events that we create at church are specifically designed for you to bring your friends to. Grief Share, Stephen's Ministry, VBS, those are for the community. Trunk or Treat is for the community. The Christmas Concert is for the community. Who can you bring? Who can you bring? Remember, we talked about this last week. The first Sunday school class was not created for well-dressed Christian kids. It was an outreach program for the poor to teach them how to read. So church programs are not exclusively for Christians. I know by and large, we think that church programs usually attract Christians, but it's the church's job to love everyone. And being a lover is an action, right? It's a verb. Love is something that you do. Yes, it's something that you are, but it's something that you do. And the truth is, the best thing our church can offer our neighbors is probably the one thing that we haven't even thought of yet. Years ago, this church decided they were going to do Vacation Bible School with all volunteers. And we're still doing it. Years ago, we said, we're going to do a Halloween event. As a church, we're going to do Trunk or Treat. And we're still doing it. So what's something else? We're not done. What is another idea? What is something else we can do for this community? Teach people a trade? Start a community garden? Have CPR classes? We can either pray for and invite those neighbors specifically, or we can just bring them, right? We can just bring them. We can bring 
the community in by creating outreach opportunities that benefit them. We can pray, we can bring, we can tell. We can tell. Second Timothy 4 says, do the work of an evangelist. Personal invitation is the number one way the church grows. Number one. It was number one when Jesus started the church. It's still number one today. We can send out a postcard to every single person in Walden and invite them to church. Do you know how many would show up? 40. Statistically, that's how many would come, 40. Compare that with a personal invitation from every single person in this room. If every single person brought one person, we would double in size in one week. Just so long as we remember, numbers for numbers sake is not why we do this. The church doesn't grow because we want more butts and seats and more bucks in the bank. Bigger isn't better. Unless bigger means more people loving Jesus. If it means more committed disciples. If it means the kingdom of God is growing, then yes, of course, it's better. And so whether it's praying or bringing or telling, the strategy of love is something that we do. We love God and we love all others. All of this worship that we do is for him. The offering is for him. The sermon is for him. We send our kids off to Sunday school for him. We pray the kingdom grows for him. We bring our friends for him. We tell others about him for him. Yes, it's our mission. Yes, it's our work, but it's first and foremost for him. Think about that. God, holy God, actually has something that he wants you to do for him. That's an honor. God asks Abram in the desert. He says, I have something for you to do. Do you wake up and think, there is something for me to do today for God. God has chosen me out of all the people. God has put me in this community. He has put me in this neighborhood and he has given me something to do. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul says, I have finished my work, and I am done. Wouldn't you love to be able to say that? Don't you want to be able to say, I did it, Lord. I, I did what you asked. I ran that race. I stayed faithful. I kept the faith. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. You are created for a purpose. There is a crown in heaven for you. Forget all these earthly projects. Forget that, forget that raise you're working for or, or that assignment you're on right now or that account you're working with or that homework or that yard work. What will any of those things get you? The approval of your neighbors. Wouldn't you rather have a crown? We spend so much time looking down the road of our life, that day-to-day -day struggle. We forget but there's a finish line at the end of that road. Why did God make you? Why are you here? Is it just to hold down a job? Is it just to pay a mortgage? Is it just to keep your kids happy? Is it just to move up the corporate ladder? God placed you in this time, in this year, with your neighbors, with your friends, with your classmates, with those people at your job, God specifically puts you here right now. 
What does he want you to do? What does he want you to give? How does he want you to serve? Because I don't want to go to heaven with a list of excuses. I don't want to say, God, I, you know, I didn't do what you wanted. I wasted my time. I had a really bad year. Darkness is going to send temptation after temptation after temptation. Evil is going to try so hard to keep the church from being unified. The evil one is going to try so hard to keep the church chasing after a million objectives that don't matter. He's going to try so hard to keep us caught up on earthly, petty, personal issues. Look at giving. Giving's been down this year. Why has giving been down this year? Why are we just scraping by right now? Oh, it's because we have a Democrat in office. Oh, it's because uh, it's summer. Oh, it's because gas prices are high. So the stock market is down. All right, tell me something. What does any of that have to do with God? Look at Jesus' prayer again. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. My prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. Jesus prays for your protection against all of your worries and fears. And so when all the naysayers are out there talking about the future of the church or the future of this country, can you just relax and realize that Jesus covers his church with a prayer of protection. Jesus even said once that the gates of hell would not prevail against us. Jesus wants us to love others and the church will grow. Jesus wants us to love him and the church will grow. He's already prayed for protection and he's already prayed for our unity. So we have nothing to fear. What could possibly thwart God's plan? What could possibly run against God's prayer? I can't think of anything. I want you to think about your holiness this week. I want you to think about your ministry this week. I want you to think about growth this week and how God can use you to love him more and to love others more. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the bride of Christ. We thank you because she is beautiful and she is holy and she is pure and she is your plan. She is your plan to reach every single person for the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that your church is holy. We pray that your church is a place of prayer. It is a place of ministry. It is a place of of telling. It is a place of bringing. It is a place where we see an empty seat and we are saddened, saddened, Lord, for those empty seats. We pray that those seats are filled with people who want to be a part of this movement of love. Lord, may we create a movement of love that begins in our homes. In our homes, Lord, how can our our homes right now in our neighborhood be used for the church, be used for your kingdom, used for your glory? How can I be the Christian on my street? How can I be the church where I live? How can I make the name of Walden Church grow so that it can be a bright, light on a hill, a light that shines in darkness, a light that illuminates the cross and the work of Jesus. Lord, it's time to roll up our sleeves. It's time to get ministry done. It's time to love more than we've ever loved before. Guide us, Lord. Direct us, Lord. We are your church. We are your body of believers. Amen. Hey, once again, I want to thank you for joining us here on YouTube. But of course, 
you know we're here. We are here. We are open. We are open every Sunday. We love you and we want you to be here with us. We miss you. We miss you. We miss your face. We miss your contribution. Uh, we have two services every Sunday, one at 9.30. That's our traditional service. We have a choir, we sing hymns, and we have a service at 11 o'clock. It's more contemporary, it's laid back, come as you are. It's also the same hour we have a children's program from nursery all the way through high school. And every single Wednesday, we have youth group all through summer. I know some churches take summer off and your youth kids are at home and they're bored. Send them our way. We love youth and we have a program that goes all through the summer. We've got a full summer program set out. Send them over Wednesdays at six o'clock. They can ride their bike, ride their skateboard, walk over, we're so close. They're gonna see their friends from school. They're here already and we will even feed them for you. We'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. I love you guys. How can you be the church where you live this week?